Europe Out Loud, a podcast about Europe's history, culture, and civilization. Brought to you by the Martin Center with Frederico Reo. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of our podcast series, Europe Out Loud. My name is Federico Ottavio Reo. I'm a research officer at the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies. We decided to dedicate today's episode to women, to all women, but most particularly to European women, and to release it on the occasion of International Women's Day 2018 the 8th of March. In tune with this intention, the topic of the episode will be the status and role of women in Western civilization. If I were to go along with current trends about gender relations, I should probably start by apologizing for having a one-man podcast on the role of women in Western civilization. But I hope listeners will agree that the thesis that I am trying to present is a rather provocative one. Contrary to the conventional wisdom according to which women have been the subject sex throughout most of Western history, I would like to argue that women were not the subject sex, that they shaped history as much as men did, and in fact, they did it most powerfully in the Christian and the aristocratic phase of Europe's civilization that preceded the French Revolution, even more than they are doing in our own time. In order to make that case, I have chosen to divide the, my um, overview in three broad periods. First of all, the role of women in the ancient world up to the fall of the Roman Empire and then spread of Christianity. The role of women in the Christian and aristocratic phase of Europe, so roughly speaking from the high Middle Ages up to the French Revolution. And finally, the role of women in the age of modern democracy and egalitarianism. So let's start with the role of women in the ancient world. A striking thing when one uh, thinks about Greek and Roman classics is that the most prominent women in power actually belonged not to Western civilization, meaning Athens and ancient Greek, but uh, most often, most commonly, to Oriental civilization. Some of them are legendary women, Cleopatra in Egypt or Semiramides, the, the legendary queen of Syria. In the West, the position of women was more problematic. Everyone knows that women had no rights of citizens and voting in, in ancient Athens, for example, in democratic Athens. And although they, some women played a prominent political role in the Roman world, they were not the titular owner of political power. There is no Roman empresses, but they often exercised political power on behalf of their husbands and sons who were incapacitated or minors. However, in the ancient world, women play an important role in religion and worship. There is an abundance of female goddesses, most of them connected with the mother herd and the notion of women fertility and the special relationship of women with motherhood and fertility. Demeter, Ceres, Isis are some examples and some of the positions in ancient priesthood were reserved to women. For example, the, the main oracle of the ancient world, the oracle of Delphi, was spoke through the Pythia, which was a young virgin. <music> change happens with the advent of the spread of Christianity in the ancient world in the Roman Empire. In this, as in many other avenues, spheres of life, the advent of Christianity represents a revolution in gender relations. The basis of this, this revolution is theological basis, as its roots, in fact, in the notion of theological equality, the notion that men and women as are created equal and are theologically equal in the eyes of God as creatures created in the likeness of God. But, of course, it has, this notion has very solid basis in the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, since the, the first book of the Old Testament, the Genesis, Adam recognized the equality of Eve by greeting her as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The New Testament, the Gospels, is full of conversations between Jesus and women, and women play a very important role in the New Testament. They are the ones who discover the resurrection to which the resurrection is revealed, and they are those who spread the news on the resurrection. And there is, of course, the very special status of the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, the Christian tradition. The Holy Virgin became a model of feminine holiness throughout the centuries that inspired generations of Christian women on the path to sainthood. 
Church history abounds with women who reached great achievements and uh, high status in Christianity. There were women saints, there were female reformers, there were women who were founders of order. It would be impossible to recall all of them, but some of them have an almost legendary status. Saint Jean of Arc, the patron saint of France, who led French armies against the English during the Hundred Year Wars. Some women are doctors of the church, meaning that they made special contribution to theology and doctrine. St. Catherine of Siena is one of them. St. Teresa of Avila is another one of them. St. Clare of Assisi is the founder of the female branch of the Franciscan order. St. Elizabeth of Hungary was a princess and achieved a very high status in the pantheon of Christian saints. Not to speak about St. Teresa of Calcutta in our own days, close to our own days. And the list could continue. But women were not only active in the church. They also ruled countries. They signed treaties. They waged wars in the Christian West, something that we only started seeing in the democratic West most recently. I believe that Margaret Thatcher was the first female prime minister, so 30, 30 years ago. Here again, the list would be endless. In the Middle Ages, we could refer to Eleanor of Aquitaine, who ruled both England and France. Blanche de Castille uh, ruled France through civil wars and crusades. Anne de Bretagne brought Bretagne to the French kingdom. Isabel of Spain is, one of, is probably the founder of the Spanish state. Elizabeth of England during the, the Renaissance, the great Elizabeth. Catherine of Medicis in France who ruled France during the religious wars. Anna of Austria who was born a Spaniard but became regent of France and fought once more to uh, difficult civil wars. Catherine of Sweden, these are all 17th century women. Catherine of Sweden was one of the greatest patrons of the arts in her own century and then uh, converted to Catholicism and died in Rome. She's probably one of the very few women who are buried uh, still nowadays in the Vatican. In the 18th century, we have figures like Catherine II of Russia, who ruled the Tsarist Empire, Maria Theresia of Austria, probably the greatest Habsburg ruler of the, of the modern time, not to talk about, of course, Queen Victoria of England. Some of these women has given their name to entire epochs, like the, the Elizabethan epoch or the Victorian epoch in England. And finally, we should not forget that in the Christian and the aristocratic civilization of Europe, women played a very important role as patrons of the arts and of literature. <laughs> Here, some French names especially come to mind. The Marquise de Sévigné in the, in the epoch of the Sun King was animated, one of the greatest literary salons of the 17th century. But closer to us, uh, Ninon de l'Enclos became legendary in the Age of Enlightenment for supporting witty young intellectuals. Voltaire actually was one of them. He could not have started his career without the support of uh, Ninon de l'Enclos. And a scholar of this issue has, has defined French saloons as feminine institutions of civility. So before moving on, just to conclude, I think it is difficult to deny that the contribution of women in the Christian and the aristocratic phase of Europe civilization was immense. What uh, characterizes it is the fact that it was specifically feminine. It was contribution that was made based on the assumption of a role. These women were proud of their identity as women. Uh, they did not want to be assimilated to men. And the vision of gender relations was based on Christian anthropology, in which women and men, as I have explained, were deemed to be theologically equal in dignity, but this did not mean that they were not sexually and biologically differentiated. They were, and this could justify some differentiation in their social functions too. Equality was not seen as sameness, as we tend to do today, as total identity, as total lack of any differentiation, and difference was not necessarily seen as inequality. Now, we may agree or disagree with this approach, but we, if we are truthful to history, we, we must talk about differentiation. We cannot talk about discrimination or subjection as far as the hallmark of gender relations in the Christian West is concerned. <music> then came the French Revolution and the beginning of political and social modernization based on democracy and egalitarianism. And here the convention of wisdom is that democracy and equality liberated women from their age-old subjection. 
Once more, the reality of history is that democracy and equality first disempowered women and then in a, in a second phase created the condition for an assimilation of women and an indifferentiation of women with men. From the Napoleonic era to feminism and the two world war in which women played a very active role that put them center stage in the, in the social and economic life, women were clearly disempowered in the early phase of modern political development in the 19th century. Once more, as in the old Athens, they did not enjoy, for example, voting rights. And this is probably part of the democratic logic of the time. Democracy meant equality, but an equality in, uh, for example, the readiness to fight and die for the fatherland. And women, of course, did not wear weapons, did not carry weapons, did not fight in combat, and therefore they were considered to be excluded from the realm of political citizenship. So the first phase of democratic development saw women increasingly disempowered, and this is probably the phase in which the myth of age-old subjection spread. It is in the mid to late 19th century that we start seeing in Marxist literature a tendency to portray women as enslaved by capitalism since the dawn of capitalism, or uh, in which we, we see pamphlets such as a famous pamphlet by John Stuart Mill, The Subjection of Women, in which the subjection of women is considered very ancient and somehow related with the traditional backward institutions of European civilization. And we come then to the modern time with many jumps and omissions, inevitably. Under modern feminism, the tendency has been to deny the specificities of women and to search for a radical assimilation and radical equality of rights and duties with men. Any belief in gender differentiation in our, time, in our own time is labeled as sexist and treated as discriminatory. Of course, compared to the traditional approach of our society, something here is lost, particularly in the attempt of feminists to destroy perhaps the most quintessential aspect of femininity, its, its nature as the fertile sex and its, its special bond with fertility, motherhood, the offspring and the family, which is recognized since the ancient worship of goddesses that I, that I was referring to. So to conclude now, it seems to me that the modern discourse on women and gender relations has offered two grotesque visions which have no basis whatsoever in historical reality, two extreme visions, one more more of a left-wing vision, the other one more of a right-wing vision. The first vision is the notion that the only way out of age-old subjection is radical sameness and indifferentiation, radical equality of rights and duties. That's the feminist, the modern feminist view. And the other is the notion, which is more widespread in conservative circles, that the, the traditional role of women and the rightful role of women is to bear and rear children and to be confined to the domestic sphere. And as I have tried to show... Both these notions are of no basis whatsoever in history. In Western history, women were not just mothers and spouses. They were rulers, they were saints, they were influential social reformers. But they did all this by recognizing their differences with men, by embracing the differences with men, and by bringing a specifically feminine contribution to history. The adjective feminine came out very often in, in my thoughts. The Holy Virgin as a model of feminine holiness. Therefore, based on these thoughts, it is perhaps not too much to hope in this International Women's Day 2018 that we could walk out of current tendency towards mutual recriminations, bitterness, self-centeredness in, in gender relations, and perhaps embrace a notion of mutual love, respect, and understanding that does not deny our differences, accept that there are gender differences, but that these differences make us richer, they don't make us poorer, or they don't enslave one sex to the other. And therefore, on this note, I would like to thank you all for listening and to wish you all Happy Women's Day. That was today's episode of Europe Out Loud. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.